Psalm 23. I would assume this psalm has, some of you guys have the ability to recite this without even looking, yeah? Yeah. This isn't necessarily something you, you, you have to look up. You've heard this um, in many funerals, and you have um, probably learned this at a very young age in children's church, all of the things. Um, my question to you um, is, do you know what it means? See, do I get ahead of myself already? Yeah, okay. Um, the, the Bible is something you should read. Did you know that? <laughs> the Bible is also, at times, hard to understand. Did you know that? Yep. Yeah. Did you know that there's context around the scripture that you're reading? What I mean by that is like, these are actually people who lived, and there was cultures that they lived in that, that aren't necessarily, like, so sometimes we read the scriptures and we don't quite understand what we're trying to learn here. So this morning, we're, we're, we're talking about good plans uh, of, of God, and, and I hope I hope I do my job by showing you the good plans God has for you in these six verses. Is it six? I think it's six. Don't judge me if I'm wrong. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. Amen and amen. We live in a very interesting world these days. We live in a, a world full of dysfunction. We live in a, in a world full of hurt and fear and death. Even uh, uh, the, the things that are happening in the Middle East right now. Our world is full of lust and envy. It's full of get-rich-quick schemes and trends to make yourself more appealing. It's full of, if I work hard enough, I can do this on my own. It's full of end-of-world in, in conspiracies that breed nothing but chaos and confusion. I don't know if you know, but the rapture didn't happen. <laughs> were, you, were you wondering if I was going to say it? That was on my first page. Here's the deal. <laughs> Conspiracy theories, um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, did, did you did you guys see the eclipse? Yep. I did not. I was counseling. Um, it is totally okay. I can tell it got dark outside. It's fine. Um, but it, here's the problem with with conspiracy theories um, is that um, they breed chaos and confusion. And if you read your Bible you would know that chaos and confusion does not come from God, but it comes from the enemy. And God is not interested in confusing his people. God is interested in making his path known well. The other thing that I think is awfully important to, to pay attention, and I don't, I don't say any of this to, to offend um, anybody by any means whatsoever. I say this because sometimes I think our world is so chaotic, our world is so full of noise, that, and it's, the, it's really the point behind my message today, is that we forget 
God's faithfulness for our lives. But the reality is, is that Jesus himself says, I don't know the day, the time, or the place that I'm coming back. And so if Jesus doesn't know, I'm not sure you do. That is not, I don't mean that to be an offensive statement. I mean that to say, let's stop focusing on what's happening around the world. And the, and the reality is, is like, I'm not 100% sure God is super interested, or at least I'm not interested in God's plans for the nation. I'm interested in God's plan for my life. Because it is, it is in that transformation that changes the people around me. Again, I say this, and I always say it because I, I try and do everything I can, like, for myself, not necessarily for you. I got to stay humble, right? Pride is gross. Pride is, has been a part of my life. I need to, I need to not be a pride. So when I, say, when I say God transforms my life and changes other people, it is not because I'm the preacher who's standing up in front of you uh, saying that I'm some great thing. No, it is the Holy Spirit that works on the inside of us that changes the hearts of the people around us. Amen. So when, when we stop worrying about what God's plan is for the nation and we start worrying about what God's plan is for my life and we see provision and we see protection, then I have the ability to conquer the things that are in front of me, not, are the, not the things out there that I can't do anything about anyway. Too many of us focus, too many of us, myself included, guys. But you got to understand, I don't know the last time I preached a message that wasn't to myself, okay? So we're all on the same page. We're cool with that? That's fantastic. So many of us focus on what is happening around the world that we forget, we, we, we lose track. It's not that we don't know. There may be someone in this room that doesn't know God's plan for you. And I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope that I could just give you just that much insight because this much of a ch perspective change will change your life forever. That, that's the beauty about God is that he, uh, we're not talking, I don't, uh, I don't need this massive change for you to see that Jesus is working in my life. Jesus transforms our hearts from the inside out that you would see the fruit at some point in time. But what God is doing in my heart, and I'm telling you, the perspective changes is that much. When you, when you get a glimpse of the grace of God that is on your life, you will see the, the depths of grace that you had no idea was even available to you. And if it's available to you, then it's available to your enemy. Uh. If, 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 if I just get a glimpse of the fact that, like, the world does not love you. I don't care what you give to it. The world will eat you up and spit you out. So when we talk about love, I can love my wife and I can love tacos. <laughs> but when God speaks of love... When God speaks of joy, when the Holy Spirit dwells on the inside in such a manner that joy exudes, joy is overflowing. We're talking Romans 15, 13, a joy that is abounding. To mean, that means to overflow. That means that there's too much. That means it, it is splashing off. This joy is splashing off from the, to the people around me. I don't have to perform. It's the one place in your life, actually, the one relationship in your life that you don't have to perform for. Amen. Jesus isn't asking you to be perfect in order to be accepted. Jesus is saying, buddy, I want all of your baggage because I can transform that into something you had no idea. But when we focus on what's happening around us, we start to lose sight of what God wants to do in us. Pastor, last week, um, we started this sermon series, um, which, hey, FYI, I don't think he's, is he watching right now? I don't know. I got pastor to do a sermon series. I'm just saying. <laughs> if you've been around a, time, a, a little while, you realize that was a bit of an act of God. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I started talking to, to Q about this <clears throat> a couple of months ago. I was having conversations with some teenagers that are just trying to figure out life, right? Are you still trying to figure out life? 
Like, it's kind of a um, let me know when you figure it out type of deal, right? But they are. The, and the questions are, are vast. Like, okay, so God is good. How does this play out? If God is good, what is, what is uh, I mean, eternity, the thought of eternity could be scary, right? Thank you, whoever said that. At least there's one of you. How, and so we're talking to teenagers about, okay, what is this? How, how, how does this look? And, and if God has good plans for my life, like they don't even know the word, pro, what, what does provision mean? And so we, I was just kind of wrestling with these conversations and where it is that I got to take these young minds who listen to me for like 2.3 seconds and then we got to go do something else. Um, what is it that... that that is going to stick with them. What is what are what are the plans of God? And just kind of snowballed, snowballed really for Heather and I in in our own home. Just through different things, tough relational dynamics, personal opportunities that kind of came out of the blue that we weren't necessarily expecting. Uh, a cancer scare. Uh, I had a. a, a, a it's nothing more than the enemy at work, to be honest with you. But it is like a uh, little little little. A little puckered up here, a little nervous, mental health issues in, in, in our kids. I was like, man, it just, and then I found this song that honestly, it was just one of those that I could not stop. I could not stop listening to. Now, I'll be honest with you, may, may be a, a, a personal song. I don't think that it, that it is. But the, the more I listened to this song, the more I was reminded of the stories in the Bible of God's faithfulness. The more I listened to, to this song, the more I could remember stories in the Bible where God saw that individual through from the beginning to the end. The, the more I listened to this song, I was reminded of a God who is faithful regardless of what it is that I go through. For me, this series is is an important reminder and maybe even a call to the church that if you want to see the faithfulness of God, maybe we should get back in the Bible. Not Not because God isn't speaking out here, and I don't want you to misunderstand me. I don't, I don't want you to, 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 to think that I don't believe the Holy Spirit can fall and things happen. I, I, don't, I don't want you to, but sometimes, and, and I've said this already multiple times, sometimes our lives get so enamored with, with the things of the world. Our, our schedules get so full with the things that we think we have to, to keep up with. Our, our, our lives get so busy that we forget that God still has good plans for you and I. And so what do we do in those times? What do we do in, in the times post-Easter? We, we celebrated Jesus resurrecting. He, he died on the cross for us and he resurrected. And we have the ability, like it's, it's super exciting, right? But God's blessings and God's plans for you did not stop on the cross or after the cross and his resurrection. God has good plans for you right now in this moment. So the word then becomes a reminder of his steadfast love for you and I. But here's the problem. I I think we live in a culture that is um, a a, a Christian culture, actually. Not just the world as a whole, but I think we live in a world that a Christian world that is biblically illiterate. And I'll be honest with you, I mean it from, there's two sides to that coin. There are people who read the Bible or who, who are scared to read the Bible and it's like, man, I don't, I don't, this, this is hard. I don't, I don't quite understand. I don't quite, I, I, if, if, but I believe if we were to spend time in the word, word, we would see God's faithfulness through story after story after story. But on the flip side, 
I think that we have some people who read the Bible on a regular basis who are also biblically illiterate. And what I mean by that is that if we would spend more time in the Word, we would understand that the book should not be used as a weapon to justify our prejudices. The book, this book, this, this book who, I'll be honest with you, I've spent a lot of my upbringing trying to figure out what it means. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Why are we lay, laying in green grass? We'll get there. We'll get there. This book is full of stories of God's faithfulness and love for his people. It's a story about the power, uh, 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 the power of redeeming a people who have lost their way time and time again. It's a story about a God who says that he'll never leave and he'll never forsake his people, even though we continue to leave and forsake him. It's a story about a God who, who loves the marginalized. He doesn't just sit with the marginalized. He loves the marginalized. He, he doesn't just sit with the people that you wouldn't sit with. He loves the people that you wouldn't sit with. It's a story about a God who, who, uh, who uses teenagers to become kings, who, who uses teenagers to become um, senior pastors of the largest church at that time in Ephesus. It's a story about a God who reminds people thrown into exile that he'll never leave them. Pastor talked about it last week. One of the, one of the most, if you, <clears throat> the story of Jeremiah Jeremiah 29, 11 is what Pastor talked about last week. I have a plan and a purpose for your life. It starts with, with saying, I, I knew you and formed you in your mother's womb, right? But if you don't understand the, the context of it, like, oh, this is the first time in Scripture that God was seen outside of the temple. Until this point, the Israelites had to go to the temple to worship God. But they were just thrown into exile again. Wait a second, what's happening? The Babylonians threw them into exile. <clears throat> and God looks at them and says, hey man, you ain't got to go there. I am here with you. Yeah. This, is game, this is a game changer for them. It is the first time you realized Jesus was a part of your life. It was like, oh my gosh. I've never seen colors the way I've seen colors. I've never had grace the way I have grace. I never... I never knew I could speak this way. God transforms when God shows up in your life. Oh, it's a game changer. This Bible is a story about a God who says, I will be their shepherd and I will find every lost one. Amen. Read Ezekiel 34. It'll change the way you see. Mm, nope. It's a story about a God who paid the ultimate sacrifice and hung on a cross for you and I. The Bible is full of stories that remind us of God's plans for our lives. That when we can't see him, we can read and say, nope, I don't know where he's at right now. I don't know what he's doing. I, I, it's been a minute since I felt like I, I, I could hear from God. So I'm going to get back in the word, and I'm going to see how God has been faithful time after time after time. I'm going to, I'm going to, read, I'm going to read stories like Joseph. Joseph, who, who God gave him a dream. Have you, ever, have you ever felt like God laid something on your heart only for you to wake up the next day, and it's just like getting slapped day after day and you know that, that, that God gave you that dream but that dream keeps getting further and further and further away it's, it's not making sense have, have, you ever, have you ever told something uh, told someone something like hey uh, you know Dale God laid this on my heart and you're laughed out of the room yeah. God, God spoke to, to you you know without a shadow of a doubt God spoke to you about something and 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 here's the crazy thing about Joseph. Joseph didn't go tell like his classmates at school. Joseph told his kin, his, 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 his family, his flesh and blood. And they're like, not a chance. This is not happening. I don't know who you think you are. 
I don't know what you think you're about. I don't know why you think you have the ability. Have you ever been like any, any family drama in the house? You tell something to your siblings and they're like, you ain't that good. Oh, listen, I would just be honest. Like this could be a personal narrative for me. Like my, my, my inner narrative is that I'm never going to be enough. If I allow that to be the, the focus of my life, I'll never do this again. Because I, I, don't, I, I don't know that any of us deserve to be able to do what it is that I do. But he has me here, talking to you. Probably, FYI, at least at one point in time in my life, one of the most unqualified people to do this job. You know that whole thing, he'll use a donkey. <laughs> he gives Joseph a dream. He tells his brothers, and listen, like if you, if you know the dream, it's like, eh, I could see why that was kind of like arrogant. His brothers, not happening. So his dad tells him to go to Dothan to get his brothers to come back. And Joseph, um, Joseph finds, and, and, and the, the, the scripture says that they saw Joseph coming from a ways away, and they started plotting his death. Like, this got to a whole new level. There's some serious family trauma going on here. They're, this is not working out so well. And really, the only reason he didn't die was because one of his brothers, Reuben, stepped in and was like, hey, maybe we shouldn't just off him. Maybe we'll sell him into slavery. And so they did. And you got to think, like, Joseph was like, well, this isn't how I thought this was going to go. <laughs> right? Like, God gives you uh, a word, and the next thing you know, your, your turn, you are, you are, you're a slave, you're like, well, you know, maybe, maybe in the dream next time you could give me a little bit more detail of, hey, so I'm going to give you the dream, and it's going to come to fruition, but it's going to be hard to get through this dream, FYI. And it is. But if you continue to read the story, you'll read certain lines like, the Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered. This is a man who was sold into slavery by his own family. But the Lord was with him. It wasn't easy for Joseph. It didn't look like Joseph thought it was, it was supposed to look like. But when you get to the end of the story, when you get to the end of the story, it, it has his brothers, the guys who wanted him dead, the guys who sold him into slavery, looking back at him, Joseph, saying, I will be your slave. And for some of us, we look at that like, yeah, it's exactly what should happen. They sold me into slavery. I'm going to sell them into slavery. They sold me, so I have the ability to get back at them. But that is not Joseph's response. That is not Joseph's response at all. Uh, Genesis 50, 19 through 21, and you'll, you'll know part of this, but I don't know that you'll know it all. It says, don't be afraid. I, am I in the place of God? You intended harm for me, but God intended it for good. How many of you guys have heard that scripture? But check this out. To accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he assured them, he, uh, he assured them and spoke kindly of them. What you intended to harm me, God intended for good. But you need to know, not just good to accomplish what I needed, but it is in the saving of the many. Amen. Yeah, guys, this is, this is life-changing. This is a, so God, what God, what, what the enemy intended for evil, God intended for good. Yeah, that's fantastic. We're good there. But do you understand that in the turning bad to good, many lives are changed. It's not just about you. Guys, our whole faith, I don't know if you realize this, is built on a man who sacrificed his life for you. 
How much more then do we need to sacrifice for others? This is the Jesus that we serve, that he would lay down his life, that he is the good shepherd who said, I will die for you. So when bad things happen, God will turn them for good, but not just to save you, but to save your home. Not just to save you, but to save your husband or your wife. Not just to save you, but maybe to save the marriage or the financial crisis or your work environment. I don't know. You do. There's a couple of things to, to, to keep in mind that I think are, are, are super important One, when it comes to Genesis 50, 19 through 21. One, God will see you through all that is trying to bring you down. Everything that is trying to bring you down at this moment, God will see you through it. Amen. Two, and as he sees you through it, I already said this, but I'm going to say it again. As he sees you through it, it is your witness that will save more than just your life. It will save many lives. And here's maybe the most important thing for our culture today to understand. When when you see God's faithfulness, his provision and his protection, revenge is so far off the table that your enemies will live live lives that are provided for. I'm going to say it again because I don't think you understand. When God works through you, you are saved, many are saved. And God's faithfulness through the provision and protection, revenge is so far off the table that even your enemies' lives will be provided for. Why? Because God's not scared of your enemies. You may not like them. You may have an issue with them. But that's his creation. And if he can save you, he can save them. Guys, that's a game changer. It is, it, is, it is how we see the world. Your worldview through the eyes of Jesus is always going to be different than your worldview through your own eyes. And our job is not to be people who are Christian that live sometimes Christian Our job is to be little Christs. That's what Christian means, if you didn't know. And if we are to be little Christs, then how I walk and how I talk have to be formed by Jesus. Not by CNN, not by Fox, not by your social media accounts. By Jesus. Spiritual formation. It's kind of a big deal. I don't know if you know, we've been talking about it since like 13 months ago. 14, 15, I don't know, it doesn't matter. We've been talking about it for a year, on and off. At least I have. Every sermon I've preached, I've preached one scripture to you. Do you remember what that is? Huh? Philippians 4.9. Philippians 4.9. You're good. The things that you have seen and heard, the things that that you have learned from me, put it to practice. It's our whole goal. You do not have to memorize this, okay? Even though I just told you you should read it, as you should, I'm not asking you to memorize it. But here's the deal. Spiritual formation is not so I get better. Spiritual formation is so that the congregation gets better. And I'm not talking about that because Pastor Sean. I'm talking about we are being formed by something at all times. No matter what, whether you're watching women's basketball or men's basketball, whether you're watching the Masters or Meet the Press, Something is forming you. The question is maybe twofold. Do you realize that? And are you adjusting to see it through Jesus' eyes, not Fox News' eyes? Spiritual formation, guys. To be spiritually formed is not 
so that I have a bunch of knowledge to stand before you to look like it, like make it look like I know what I'm doing. Spiritual formation is a change of my heart to change you. It's a change of your heart to change me. I got way off topic. I apologize. In, in, in the story of Joseph, you see God's plan come to pass. And while it is a dream um, that, that came to pass, there are certain characteristics or attributes about it that I think are super important to pay attention to that we also see in Psalm 23. And that is God's plan for provision and protection. I've talked about it a couple of times throughout the service already. I'm not sure it's I'm not sure it's God's plan for your life to have a million dollars. I'm not sure there I'm not sure when we talk about being prosperous in God that has little to do with monetary funds. You know when it comes to God's plan for your life I think I've already said this in this service. I don't know. But the fruits of the Spirit are way better than any dollar that's in your bank account. Provision and protection. God's plan for your life. Provision and protection. Psalm 23 in Psalms 23, David's asking one question, and I'll, I'll try and hurry through this. He's asking one question. What does it mean for Yahweh to be my shepherd? Now, if, if you're new to the faith, who is Yahweh and why are we talking about a shepherd? So maybe another way to ask this question is, what does it mean to trust God with my life? What does it mean, David's asking the, or trying to answer the question, what does it mean to trust God with my life? David understood what it meant to be a shepherd. He was one. And so to, to use that metaphor to apply to his relationship with God makes a lot of sense. But I would assume there's not a lot of sheep herders around here. Anybody herding sheep? I had a hand raise over there. I was like, oh, you caught me off guard. I, even, if you, even if you know what it means to herd anything, today is going to look different than what it did back then. You're not staying the night with your animals. We have these pretty little things today called perimeter fences to keep your animals in, though we could talk a whole thing on regenerative agriculture. We will not do that today. We do not shepherd. I got cows. I don't shepherd my cows the way David would shepherd his sheep. So here's, the, here's, here's why this is important. If you don't understand the context of what you're reading, it will fall on deaf ears. And I need you to understand that what Paul, or no, excuse me, what David is saying in Psalm 23 is super important for our lives even today. Though we're talking about him being a shepherd and we're laying in green pastures and he's leading us beside waters, like I, all of these things make sense. That, that, that you, you understand what green pasture is, you understand what still water is. Why? What is, what is David actually saying here? The word shepherd is often applied to God in the Old Testament. <coughs> uh, Psalm 80, verse 1, uh, God is addressed, uh, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock. Israel's kings are also referred to as shepherds, which is pretty important. Uh, caveat, if, if, I, if I actually finish the entirety of my message, I use a lot of different scriptures. If you're not taking notes... Um, I'm not judging you, um, but if you get halfway or to the end of the sermon and like, I don't, 
I don't remember all of the scriptures. Like, I'll give you my notes, okay? Um, but, but these are, here's, here's why this is important. We read, um, we read Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We read Jeremiah 29.11. I have a plan and a purpose for your life. But we don't, we, we, can you point me to Philippians 4.13 anywhere else in the Bible? But it's there. Here, here's the thing. From beginning to end, there is one story in the Bible, and that is God's love for his people. Amen. And so it is my job to take Psalm 23 and show you all of the different areas that it is in the Bible, okay? Because if scripture does not interpret scripture, it will fall flat on its face at some point in time. So the, the things, the, the provision and the protection that is God's plan for your life is not just found in Psalm 23, it's not just found in Genesis through the story of Joseph. It is found throughout the Bible. So if I read a lot of scripture and you're not following me, I'll, I'll give you my notes, okay? Israel's kings are also referred to as shepherds. We see this in Jeremiah 23 and Ezekiel 34. God promises to set up shepherds uh, over them who will feed them um, and so that they, they, they shouldn't fear any longer. John 10, 11, John, we know John 10, 10. For the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come to give you life and give you life abundantly. And, and John, uh, in verse 11, Jesus refers to himself as the good shepherd. His goodness is, is in giving his life for his sheep. We have to understand that for David to call God his shepherd, it is to acknowledge that God is his king and his savior. So for us... We may not call him shepherd, we may call him king or savior. But what, we, what is important to understand is that when we do that, he is the one, he is the one. He is the one who meets all of our needs. My wife cannot meet all of my needs. Uh, you saw uh, Jerry Maguire, You Complete Me. You remember that movie? That was kind of an old movie. Well, for some of us. When God, when, when, when David refers to God as a shepherd, it is us referring to Jesus as our king. But you, you need to understand why this is important because it is, it is in doing so that everything that David needs comes from his savior. My question to us this morning is everything that we need, does it come from Jesus? Uh, you can answer that, I can't. I can tell you in my life, there's a lot of times where my needs I'm trying to ha be, have met from anything other than my Savior. The beautiful thing, if, if you're worried about that, the beautiful thing is that we have the ability to say, to recognize it and say, Father, forgive me, and he does. Every time. Every time. This is what David means when he says, I shall not want. Everything, every need, every desire will be met by the guiding and providing of God. Now, here's the deal. One would ask, how do we see that in the scripture? I'll do my best to show you at least part of it. Number one, shepherds make their sheep rest. He makes me lie down in green pastures. I asked the teenagers, I think last week, maybe a couple weeks ago. I was like, hey, so what, is that, what does that mean? And then you get some pretty colorful responses, right? And a bunch of laughs because it was like, my wife's not in here. I'd used her for service. She heard it. I'm good, right? Like, you tell Heather, go lay down in green pasture, and she's like, what? I'm going to get bugs and ticks on me. I go outside too long, and Heather come inside, and she's like, you smell like the outside. Oh. <laughs> really?
really on your toes today, babe. <laughs> no, seriously, like, if I told you that Jesus was asking you to lay down in a green pasture, I mean, how many of us would not ask why? I would. Well, 100% like, what? why do I need to lay down in a green pasture? What is David trying to tell us here? David's saying that our lives are frantic. Our lives are full and God desires. He's not asking. He desires us to rest. He desires us to rest. The Sabbath was instituted in part to guarantee this happened. Now, as first service, I didn't know if I was going to ask second service, but here we are. How many of you guys celebrate the Sabbath? Yeah. Fantastic. Good for you. Happy for you. Envious of you. But the reality of it is, is we live in a world that you tell them you're resting in God's presence and they'll laugh, laugh at you because you didn't work 60 hours this week. We get, we get more pleasure out of pointing out how burnt out we are than resting in God's presence, even though he's asked us to. He desires us to rest in his presence. He desires that we would spend time to delight in his presence. Yeah, it, it, it is a very amen statement, but, but here's the problem, and this is the personal conviction that I have. It's like, no, God is asking me to do this, and I'm not doing it. What other areas in my life, this is the question for us, guys. What other areas in my life that God is asking me to do something that I'm not doing? And the reality of it is, is I'm not doing because we, well, on one hand, we live such busy lives that we just don't, quote, unquote, have the time. On the other hand, it's like, I don't want to be judged for, quote, unquote, resting, as a truth, guys, fellas, I, I know this is a thing for the ladies too, but I can only speak to the guys because I is one. But it's like, you burn it at both ends as if it is proof of your manhood. Just do it until you literally make yourself sick. To prove some sort of big chested macho man thing. The, and, the, and I'm happy for you that you can work a lot. That's great. Um, again, mirror on the back wall, talking to myself a little bit here. But the one who, who we say we serve, who we say meets all of our needs, we're just going to take a pass on this time. God established a Sabbath, not for you to go mess around and do whatever, but to rest in his presence, to be restored and renewed by, by his Holy Spirit. Today we are so goal-oriented and compulsive that we, we feel guilty if we rest. It's that time. We feel guilty about it. My wife, the other day, we were, we were at home. I had, a, had a, a long day, and we needed to do laundry because laundry is like an everyday thing. Uh, and... Uh, like, all I want to do is sit down. She's like, yeah, go for it. Totally fine. I thought she was in the back. <laughs> what? Yeah, there you go. He, she starts folding clothes on our bed. And I was like, yeah, you want me to rest? <laughs> I folded clothes. <laughs> but, 
let's just run down some of these really quick. He makes us lie down in green pastures. He's, he desires us to rest. He leads us beside still waters, these, these pools of water to drink freely. Jesus, Jesus provides us with rest, food, and water. When we come to him and enter his Sabbath rest or, 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 or salvation, we, we can see this in Hebrews 4, 1 through 11, which is very powerful. You should, you should definitely read it when you go home. He feeds us with himself because he is the bread which comes down from heaven. John uh, 6, 35 says, Jesus declared that I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Then Jesus gives us uh, his, uh, his spirit to quench our thirst. And John 37 and 39 says, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this, he meant the spirit. And next, David, David says that he restores my soul. So it's not just merely my body that is cared for, but it is my soul. Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, therefore do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. God promises to meet our needs, the needs in our lives and and guide our lives. And when we offer our lives as worship, And I'm not talking about the first part of a Sunday morning service. I'm talking about the totality of our lives. When we offer our lives in worship, he transforms our mind and guides us with his will. David continues by saying, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. As he restores our souls, we walk paths of righteousness. And as we are transformed, I've talked about this throughout the entirety of the service, as we are transformed, God gets the glory. His rest, he rests us with his salvation. He feeds us with himself. He quenches our thirst with his spirit. He renews and guides our steps with his way. This This right here is God's provision. And David turns uh, from God's provision to his protection. The Lord protects him from the valley of the shadow of death. The paths of righteousness do not protect us from these valleys but it is the Lord who leads us through the depression of darkness. And we, we talked about this earlier. We live in a very dark world. We go through things that are very dark, valleys of the shadow of death at times. That those dark places are where evil flourishes. But our fear is eclipsed by the presence of God. For you are with me, David says. It is the Lord's presence alone which can give us complete comfort and security. When God sends his people from Egypt to the promised land, he gives them one absolute promise. My presence will go with you and I will give you rest, Exodus 33, 14. And and as we continue to read, the, the Lord grants even more than just his presence, he grants his power to us. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The rod beats off the the external enemy and the crooked staff snatches us away from harm or snatches us away from the harm that we see. We serve a God that has power to save and restore. John 10, 27 through 28, Jesus promises, my sheep listen to my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. But here's here's what's great. 
the, the metaphor changes uh, as David deals with his enemies. He, he goes from provision to protector. Now he's the host. He seats us in the presence of our enemies at his banqueting table. He anoints us with, uh, with oil as a sign of celebration. And he fills our cup overflowing. Here's, the, here's what's important about these things. The New Testament, uh, the banquet table is a sign of salvation. Matthew 26, um, uh, verse 29, Jesus promises to eat and drink with his disciples in the kingdom of God. He leaves a banquet for us. It's why we, to, rem, to remember what he has done for us, it's why we take communion. In Revelations 19, 6, or 7 through 9, we are promised that the church will gather at the marriage supper of the Lamb when Christ comes for his bride. Here's the crazy thing. It is, it is the celebration. It is the sheer joy Christ, that, that, that Christians had that broke the persecution in Rome in the early church. It is realizing that I'm sitting at the table with my enemies. I would rather not, to be honest with you, but I'm sitting at a table of salvation with the, the anointing of the Spirit dripping over me, and my cup is so full that even the enemies will have those provisions. So I'm not worried about the fear, I'm not worried about the enemies. I have the ability to focus on the table that I'm sat at by him. And the celebration, this celebration, this party, according to David, is never ending. Surely your goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Goodness is the fulfillment and protection of God's will. Mercy is his covenant love, redemptive power, and faithfulness. The goodness and love of God will follow and pursue you all the days of your life. Amen. Thank you. I don't know why you love me this much, but man, thank you. And David ends with this final promise, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. To remain in God's presence forever. For the Hebrews, uh, the eternity was not a timeless state, but an endless days. Here's where David and us will be today, tomorrow, and forever. Psalm 23 reveals God's plans for us and for our lives through his provision and his protection. It's his house. It's his presence forever. Stand with me.